I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you uh, discovered and signed up for the July Amplify Horse Racing Hangout. And just to tell you a little bit about myself and about Amplify, I'm the Amplify co-founder. My name is Anise Mon Pleasure. I'm originally from Fargo, North Dakota. And Amplify is an initiative to share education and careers about the thoroughbred industry and really explain the industry in basic terms. Because as a newcomer who might not know a whole lot about horse racing or the thoroughbred industry, sometimes it can be hard to find the right information. And so Amplify seeks to kind of round that up and put it into one platform and create sort of a concise experience for people to come in and find out well what is horse racing what is the thoroughbred industry what are the organizations i should learn about or what are some of the careers involved and so these amplify virtual hangouts started in an effort to connect people with some of the existing industry professionals who already navigated getting into the horse racing industry educating themselves and becoming amazingly successful in their careers. And I'm so excited to share the three incredible speakers that we have tonight. And I want to mention with everyone with the invitation that I sent out, um, I also gave you guys access to a Google Classroom where I have all three of our speakers' bios posted. And even reading their bios, um, the lengthier form of the bios, I'll read a shortened bio for each one tonight, is a really good way of diving in and learning about the industry because you'll, you'll read about different races, different industry organizations. And I encourage you guys to use that classroom to post any additional questions. And also, if there's any information that we discuss here tonight, I will share it via that page. As I mentioned to some people as you were tuning in, this uh, Hangout is going to be recorded and posted on our Amplify Horse Racing YouTube page. And then at the end, I'm going to send all of you a survey. I would love to get your feedback on um, what you enjoyed, what you'd like to learn more about. And, you know, with that, I would like to welcome you to tonight's themed Hangout, which is on uh, hands on work with horses, specifically focusing mostly on. Uh, the racing side of the thoroughbred industry. Because for those of you who are new, um, there are a lot of different aspects to the thoroughbred industry. There's the breeding side, there's the racing side, and then there's also aftercare, uh, which we're going to talk a bit about tonight too, which is what happens to thoroughbred racehorses after they retire from the track. So I'm now going to introduce you guys to our three incredible speakers. So Kicking us off um, will be Rosie Napravnik. And first off, before I read their bios, I'm going to say that we have three incredibly just amazing women joining us tonight. All three have um, two were our former jockeys, but probably two of the best female jockeys in the thoroughbred industry, two of the best jockeys of all time. And then Farron Peterson, who is an up-and-coming jockey and also a veterinarian. So just, and acupuncturist. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. And so Rosie won, uh, has won the Kentucky Oaks twice, which um, many people have you know, you've probably all heard of the Kentucky Derby. The Kentucky Oaks is essentially like the Kentucky Derby for fillies or three-year-old female horses. Um, she's won two Breeders' Cup races. And she grew up in the equestrian world doing eventing and pony racing. And she's always kind of had a connection to thoroughbred aftercare, which she's going to speak to us a bit about. Um, Rosie's husband, Joe Sharp, is a successful race horse trainer. And um, she's still obviously very much involved in racing. She's retired as a jockey, but she now has her own private training operation, transitioning race horses into second careers. And then our second speaker is going to be Julie Crone who not only is a member of the Horse Racing Hall of Fame and many other Hall of Fames, as you will read in her bio, um, but she was the first woman to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, she won over 3,000 races during her jockey career, 
and um, is also the first and only woman to win a Triple Crown event. So for those of you who don't know, the Triple Crown is a series of races, um, the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness Stakes, and the Belmont. And Julie won the Belmont Stakes. She's a huge advocate for education um, between giving speeches and clinics. And she also started a junior jockey camp to bring more kids and youth into the thoroughbred industry. And you guys will learn more about her career as a jockey agent to the lovely Miss Farron Peterson. And so Farron is going to be our last speaker for tonight. And Farron also came from the equestrian world riding uh, dressage and jumpers. And she didn't have any connections to the racing industry. So she ended up going to vet school. And then while she was in college studying to become a vet, that's when she got her license to become an exercise rider and then eventually attained her jockey's license and pursued her dream of becoming a jockey. She's also a veterinarian and an acupuncturist. Ac acupuncturist. <laughs> it's a difficult word. Words are hard. And uh, so you guys are going to hear about her dual veterinary and jockey career, which is really cool. So again, um, think up lots of questions for the end when these guys are are um, finished speaking. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Rosie to tell us about how she got involved in the thoroughbred industry and her career as a jockey, and then also her current work with off the track thoroughbreds. So just talk to us about how you first became involved in the thoroughbred industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what was your entry into, like, what, what made you passionate to become involved in the thoroughbred racing industry and decide to pursue a career as a jockey? Okay, so when I was young, Steve Cawthon was, um, Steve Cawthon was just starting to ride, and I read, I had read the book, uh, I, it was funny, I had, uh, I think I had, I got, I think I got, chicken pox like oh I got mumps and I was home from school and my mom took me to a bookstore and there was a book in the bin Steve Cawthon's book by Pete Axthelm and it was called The Kid and I remember reading that book and uh already I kind of had decided to be a, be a jockey you know but reading the book because it talked about all of the qualifications like a, a, a young jockey needs you know like Steve Cawthon was really uh in, around horses when he was younger, you know, he rode his horse at horse shows and the fair, and he was always around horses, and then he went to the track because his dad was a uh, a blacksmith, and he got to go to the racetrack, and then he decided he wanted to be a jockey. And so then, because they were at, already at a racetrack, they kind of had, they understood that if you're, like, really, like, young, like, you want to try to ride the first, you know, the first year of high school almost, you know, because uh, back then, it, they used to think, oh, if an apprentice jockey is going to get big, we want them to ride when they're really young, you know? And so it was kind of like that kind of approach to things. And plus, I think Steve, his parents were like really aware that he needed to get an education and stuff. So anyway, the book was so fun for me because I didn't know anything about horse racing. And then I saw Steve Cawthon, uh, I'd seen him win the Triple Crown, but then when I got to live in the book, I'm not the triple, you know, I saw him win with Affirmed. And when I got to live in the book, the steps on how to become a jockey, you know, like you had to know the timing of like horses when they breeze. And, you know, you had to be able to like push on a horse and like switch your stick. And like there were so many technical things because I was just a kid that rode horses in Michigan. Uh, and I was in 4-H and stuff like that. So I just didn't, I didn't really know what the racetrack was about. So I had to learn like a lot from books. And so then my mom, uh, my mom and I decided that uh, it would be really fun because some of the, the husbands at the horse shows that we would go to on the weekends, they had horse racing at the weekends on the fair tracks. And so I got to like breeze the horse, like I'd go home with the families on the weekend, the horse show kids, the other kids. And then the husbands would like, they'd put me on these giant big race horses like out in the fields. And they would just like jack the stirrups up and just from reading books and just from looking at, at, at pictures and books, I would like, my dad would take pictures of me and then he'd show me like how I would look and I'd be like, oh, I have to get like way more flat on my back and I have to get my reins back more. 
because there's a part in Steve Cawthon's book when he when they talk about how the kid is going up the backside and his rein is long and loose, communicating to his horse relaxation, you know, and his back is so level and flat you could sure serve champagne on it, you know. It was just like just like the image of the jockey's like position and stuff. I was so excited to to work on that and have my dad take pictures, and then. I breathed some of the horses like out in the cornfields and then we went to little tiny race tracks, Latonia and like some other crazy little places in Michigan and they're all still there and they raced Appaloosas, quarter horses, thoroughbreds and then the quarter horses would go to straight races like 220s and you know like short little distances and then the thoroughbreds would go four times around and then the Appaloosas would uh the Appaloosas would sprint like the quarter horses, and then the Arabians would go four times around. So I got to ride a whole, whole bunch of different horses. And one time, like I did, I've done so many stupid things. Like there's, there's things that jockeys are supposed to do when you're riding. Like I was 15 years old on a fair track, you know. So it was like, and one of the rules was you had to weigh 100 pounds, and I only weighed like probably like 90 pounds. And so that I used to have to carry a 10 pound lead pad, and everybody always thought that was really funny. <laughs> and they. They would like the other jockeys helped me so much, and like I went to the starting gate with just all the all the dads from the horse show dads, you know, and their kids, and I learned how to like hold my reins in the starting gate and stuff like that. So that was really exciting for me to ride the races. But oh my gosh, when I look back on that, I was like, what were my parents thinking? You know, like and my dad would come and take pictures, and some of the tracks didn't even have rails or anything, you know. But I'm pretty sure, like to this day, it kind of uh, helped my, it helped my career in a way that when I went to Tampa Bay, once I turned 16 and I went to Tampa Bay Downs, um, at the races, like a racetrack, racetrack, I had to climb the fence. It was so funny. My mom, we drove up and it's, it's funny when you drive up to the stable gate in a racetrack, you can't get in to get a job, uh, because you're not really allowed in. You have to get on somebody's like work list or something to get in, but then you can't, meet anybody unless you get in so it was kind of like <clears throat> so I did what anybody would do that needs to go get a job and I climbed over the fence dropped down on the other side <coughs> excuse me and I had uh all my pictures my racing pictures that my dad took over the summer you know and of course I picked the ones where I was like all posed down really low and stuff on the horses and and I walked around to all the trainers and I was like oh look this is me riding races like I'm an apprentice jockey I have my you know my uh my triple blog and I haven't won any races and I, but I won like 80 races at the fair tracks in you know, like over two, two different seasons. And, um, so that was kind of fun. And then a guy named Jerry Pace, he would help one apprentice jockey An apprentice jockey is like a jockey just starting out. He would help one apprentice jockey every year. And his, uh, his girlfriend at the time was there and she was like, all right. And I think this year he's going to help you. And then they made a joke. Like he's never helped a girl jockey before. And then uh, Les St. Leon, whose whole family is in racing, they gave me this horse to breeze. And I breezed the horse from the wrong pole because I didn't, I didn't, I had had the racetrack on my roof, but I had a mile racetrack instead of a mile and an eighth track. And so I broke off at the wrong pole. I was trying to breeze half mile and I broke off at the five eighths, which was like, when I look at it now, it's very funny. And he still let me ride the horse and I breezed the horse in a good time and stuff. And so uh, that's kind of like how I started my career because of my desire to be like Steve Cawthon, my parents helping me, my dad taking the pictures and my mom, as long as I did something with horses, she'd help me. But if I didn't do something with horses, she wouldn't help me. So uh, I, I had a lot of my mom's help <laughs> and I was like, uh, I just went around and like just sh started asking people to put me on horses. And then I had my first winner. And before I knew it, like I had people calling me that wanted to help me. Uh, Julie Snellings and the, the Chick Langs family. He was the general manager of Pimlico. And they all kind of got together. And you really can't, I don't know many people who do it without somebody really, a main person, like helping them. And so, like, now when I look back, like, they were kind of like Farron's Julie Crone. You know, they were like, hey, you, you have something that we value and we know how much desire you have for the sport. We want to help you. Um, and I, you know, I'd live in their house for free and, well, fifty dollars that for the basement apartment, fifty dollars. So that was kind of fun. Um, and sometimes, and you know, that's all I'd make in a week. I've rode like I hardly rode any horses for months and months and months. And I used to walk around and be so mad because if someone, one more person, told me 
you know, oh, the reason we can't ride you is because you're a girl. I was just going to be like, ah, it's driving me crazy. And so, and so there's a lot, a lot that, oh, oh, I'm getting an I'm echo. I'm getting an echo. Is that better? Can you guys hear an echo? Can you guys still hear me? Really yeah. good, yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. So there's a lot that I just saw from that. And one thing that I want to share with the audience is that there are so many different ways that people learn about the thoroughbred industry or, you know, have their interest sparked. In and for you, it's a book. And, and then another thing, like, you guys just heard about the amazing entry of a elephant and jockey into the industry. And there's just so much resilience required there. And so, you know, if you guys have a passion to get into the industry, absolutely, uh, it's going to require work. But with meeting other people and being having that level of resilience, you can absolutely do it. And obviously, Julie, you wouldn't be recommending now for people to climb fences to get into the track. But with with you know, you're obviously well, not now because of COVID. But I want to climb. I want to climb the fence at Mammoth. But now you know you've had your involvement with starting a senior jockey school. You're advising Farron. What is some of the advice that you would give to kids now if they want to start on that journey to become a jockey? Well, I think that, you know, the secret to being a good jockey, no matter how you get in a racetrack, no matter who helps you, is that you have to have your horsemanship. Like, you have to know, like, you have to be able to, uh, like, if you're literally a horse person, you already have access to horses, I don't think there would be any way for you to learn enough about horses. Uh, to be a jockey there's so many different you know things that would help you like my background with horses was mostly like with the circus horses and horses that learn circus tricks like kneeling laying down bowing and you see Sylvie Zerbini and the other Italian guy with like the 20 horses that are all at liberty right that's the kind of stuff my mother did and so I was pretty advanced as far as like knowing how to like aid a horse and release the pressure to like ask a horse to go forward and be able to reward them. So you, so I developed a way to communicate with the horses that was almost like on a speed, like almost like on a speed dial. Like I look at a horse and I could size them up and just know what personality trait they have so fast. So even if you, even if a person that wants to be a jockey doesn't have access to horses, there is so many programs out there now and so many different ways to learn about horses. So that if you went to the racetrack, and you started with just like a hot walking job, which is like, you know, you're just cooling the horses out and you get to know them and their energy levels and stuff. And you can hear people talk all day, like about racehorses. And, you know, there's kind of like a couple different, there's like four different personalities of racehorses, you know. And it's like uh, when you start to learn about horses from the ground up, it is the most valuable experience that a person can ever have. Like, so even if you don't have access to horses, delve into everything that has to do with horses. Like, um, I'm a personal, I personally am favorite, favorite. I really think that Pat Pirelli has a really fun program that he teaches you how to learn along the way. And it really, especially for people who aren't around horses, it's such a, such a step-by-step -step process and so many videos that you can look up quality you can look up qualities of a horse and learn about their personality traits and uh and already like so if you're going onto the track and you're just hot walking and then somebody gives you a chance to start grooming or riding you're gonna have a big advantage on them because you can you know you can tell them what a personality of a horse is you can like uh incorporate some of your uh things that you learned about what the horse likes and doesn't like like the, one of the first things we learned on the track it's kind of funny i thought it was interesting is that someone will say this horse, don't ever stand this horse still. Like, if they don't want to stand still, just let her keep walking. Let him keep walking. You know, like, they have personality traits. And there's other ones where it's like, oh, my gosh, that horse is so funny. You know, he doesn't care what you do with them and stuff. So, but there is a, a, a particular way to, to find these horses and, uh, like, kind of label them for yourself so you can get along with them better. Because there's do's and don'ts for both horses, you know, how you get along with them. And that's one of the main things is, uh, understanding horses and that they're all individual and knowing that there's going to be steps and process to get, you know, you start out hot walking, maybe grooming, and then you get to go on and maybe, you know, shed row and ride. This is if you don't have 
the advantage of being, you know, somewhere to learn. I think the perfect scenario is being off the racetrack and learning and then coming back to the track and starting out a career that way because it would be a lot safer and a lot, uh, a lot easier. And it lays that foundation, which is, yeah, so, so instrumental. And so I'm going to hop over to Aaron and have you tell your story about how you got involved in the thoroughbred industry and uh, your journey into becoming a vet and a jockey at the same time. And then also, you know, to really just emphasize uh, the value of, of meeting the right people in the industry and how, you know, the right person or the right group of people supporting you can be instrumental in getting going. And so just tell us too about how you to meet and um, how Julie works with your agents and how you've grown as a jockey. I have one thing. Did you unplug your buds, your earbuds, or did you just take them out of your ears? I unplugged them. Okay, good, okay. okay. Uh, so I grew up riding. My mom taught me how to ride. I had an Arabian. We did dressage and jumping. I always wanted to be a jockey, but had no connections to the racing world. So then when I was about a teenager, I decided to think about vet school. So during my bachelor's degree, um, my first kind of foot in the door was when I got accepted to an internship for the summer in Kentucky. And I was working at a sports horse rehabilitation center across the street from Keeneland Racetrack. And so the thoroughbreds would come there and there was a swimming pool and an underwater treadmill, things like that. So I started really learning about the racing industry and being in the heart of Lexington. There's so much history. And so I was just kind of, you know, around all these um, very talented horse people. And they were teaching me a lot about horse racing. And so then... I started working in the thoroughbred sales. At the end of that summer, I stayed for Keeneland. And then during vet school, I would keep going back for a few days at a time to work sales. And I just wanted to diversify my experience in the thoroughbred industry. So I thought, okay, I know now about the rehab process. I want to learn about the yearling sales and handling thoroughbreds from the ground. Then I started working at a breeding farm. And I wanted to learn, you know, that is a whole another side of the industry. And uh, so I was delivering foals at night. I was helping mares get pregnant, helping stallions um, do their job. And then I asked the lady at that farm if I could learn how to start, um, you know, a horse from the ground, be the first one to put a saddle on its back, first one to ride it. So I started doing that. And uh, then I asked her if I could go to the racetrack and get my exercise rider's license because I wanted to learn how to breeze a racehorse. So then once I started going to the racetrack uh, while I was in vet school, then I decided to get my jockey license. And I just kept thinking, okay, the more that I get this personal experience, it's going to help me in my career as a veterinarian because I understand the breeding, I understand the rehab process, the exercise riding. I really know what trainers like and don't like. And, you know, it's just invaluable experience. And it's so important in any industry, really, the networking. And like Julie had said, and just having people on your side to help you and to gain credibility. So I thought um, I started traveling to Saratoga. I had gone to Kentucky. I started traveling to other countries, Japan, Hong Kong, Dubai, England, Ireland. And I just uh, wanted to find the best people I could in the industry and learn from them. So that was what inspired me when I graduated from vet school. I was up in Northern California at UC Davis, and then I wanted to go to Southern California because I had uh, some of the top jockeys in the world and some of the top trainers. So I knew it would be more competitive, but I wanted to be surrounded by that caliber of horse people. And then that's where I met Julie, who was at Del Mar. And so then that opened up that opportunity where she offered to become my agent and to train me, and so I was able to live with her for the last six months and just be trained one-on-one -on -one by her and continue growing in my horsemanship, my athleticism, and then we moved out to New Jersey, and we just started racing a few weeks ago here. Just getting my mic back on. Um, that, that is so awesome. Sarah, I'm already having my... Okay, trying to get out of the book. Um, you know, I think in my family, again, really goes to show that, you know, having that diverse array of skills and developing that hands-on horsemanship 
and understanding for the animal itself really is going to come to help you in a career for those of you who are really new to the industry. And um, Farron, I'm going to ask a kind of random question, but I heard that you were a pole vaulter in college. Yes. So, you know, what are some sports or activities that kids or uh, college students could do to prepare for an equine career, um, even if they're not, you know, directly studying something equine related? Mm -hmm. I think sports in general really help you working around horses because it's your reflexes, your body awareness, and when you're around horses, you need to be aware of that so that you protect yourself from being hurt. You know, you know where you are in relation to the horse at all times. Pole vaulting, I think, was very helpful to me. Just performing under pressure and with an audience, and it's a big mental game. There are a lot of external factors like wind, rain, things that you can't control, but you have to keep your mind in the middle and be able to perform at the top of your game. And that's the same with horse racing. I mean, we can't control the weather. Sometimes, you know, we're riding a horse we don't know, and so to just be able to be um, in a really, like, focused mindset is really important and then um but i'd say there's you know a lot of sports that just really focus on mindset and um and dedication and i think having coaches work with me and really teach me how to train properly and to be at the top um of my fitness level and so as a jockey, like a lot of my fitness, I was having to do on my own because I didn't have other jockeys to train with in the off season. But I knew from all my years of weight training and running as a track athlete, I knew how to get to that athletic um, competition body type that I needed to be in. And so now you, know, you have your career as a jockey and you're also a equine acupuncturist which is awesome that you can balance, you know, these dual careers. And, you know, you were kind of explaining to me a bit on the phone when we spoke before about how you divide up that work and what a typical day is like for you. Um, you do not work directly on the race horses. So, you know, just tell us what a typical day is like in your life right now and, and how you balance your work. Right. Uh, well, we're racing three days a week right now at Mammoth, so Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I go to the racetrack seven days a week, so we ride from about 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., get on the horses, um, check in with trainers, and then throughout the rest of the day, I often go and ride, there's a few off-the-track thoroughbreds who are now jumpers, so I go and ride them because that helps my horsemanship going back to the track. I think you can definitely translate all of the riding that you do uh, across different equestrian sports. And then I do acupuncture on some of those horses at the farm. So I'm not doing acupuncture on the racehorses on the track since I am racing on the track and I don't want there to be any questions of conflict of interest. But it does help me to be able to feel my horses when I'm riding them at the track and help my uh, trainers know if maybe they're getting a little muscle sore or something like that. And um, yeah, then Julie and I, we live together, so we train together, we watch videos, um, have a little equisizer, like a fake racehorse with a saddle, and practice on that. She makes it sound so easy. She's been on, like, 40 horses through this heat storm we've had, you know, like, 10 this morning, riding seven races, you know, craziness, how much, it's so physical, like, even watching her now, I kind of forgot, um, like, how physical being a jockey is, like, People knew, like, at 10 o'clock, or when I, like, when I went into the room at 10.30 and ate my lunch and then laid down to take a nap, my valet was like, do not wake her up for anything. Like, the president, don't wake her up. Because I was so exhausted at the end of the morning, you know, after all your breezers and stuff. And then, yeah, she makes it sound like it's, like, nothing. But, but it, the work is hard. But don't be don't be thinking you want to be part of this game if you can't be there seven days a week. Because that's, that's what it is, so... Yeah. I think that's another great part about getting all the hands-on experience like we've been talking about because you need to see, like, can you handle the early mornings? And I was never naturally an early morning person. And I remember when I first worked the first thoroughbred sale, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm walking a horse and the sun hasn't even risen. And, <laughs> and now it's like, oh, my gosh, if I ever wake up and the sun is up, something's wrong. <laughs> but uh, I had to realize, you know, when it comes to riding horses, it's very easy for me to wake up early. If it's for anything else, not so much. But 
that's why I think it's really important to get that hands-on experience and realize, do I want to dedicate my life to this? Because the thoroughbred industry is very demanding of your social life and your time, but if it's what you love, then it's great. And then I liked her as a friend first, and then I then I was like, I was inspired, and like she she put this, she has such a fire and a desire to be a jockey that she put this fire, it's like she kind of like, you know, handed it to me like E.T. phone home <laughs> and handed the light over to me and then I, I got it inside of me. So then I spent like a week trying to talk her out of it. Like, you know, and like people that meet us now, I'm like, no, don't waste your time, okay? Just accept her. She's a jockey. Don't try to talk her into anything because you're not gonna because she's got a desire. And so then she, her, her star was burning so bright and so like, you know, on, I was like, oh my gosh, I want this, I want her to be successful, and she's, she's amazing, horses love her, obviously by all her background, you know, she's kind of like, you can see the pieces fitting together, you know, um, and it was, it's just such a joy to be around, uh, a person that can put those, you know, 14 hour days in, and be so happy at the end of the day, that that's all she did all day long, and it's really fun to, that she took me, you know, away from being like in California with, you know, doing theater with my kid and stuff. And then I brought Lorelai out to New Jersey because her godparents live here. And we come here in the summer anyway. Like, this is where we come for the summer, Lorelai and I. And so I was kind of like, well, we're doing that anyway. And then to have Farron and have winning races, we're like fifth leading rider at Monmouth right now, you know, and leading apprentice. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's really, she's, she has this excitement and this fire. So when she goes like, ah, oh, then I get up early, like she, She's amazing and puts a lot into it. So, yeah. But the racing, the sport, the sport, like when people see her walking around in the morning and every person sees her smiling and walking around, everybody's like, oh, her attitude is so awesome. And she picks up everybody and makes them smile because of how much she loves racing and how much her desire is to be a jockey. That is awesome. And I think... You know, things that our audience can take away from this is that, you know, there's so much value in, you, know, you have to have a strong work ethic in any job, but particularly this industry, because it is really demanding. You're, you know, you have animals that are depending on you. Uh, they require care 24-7, 365 days a year. You have to have the work ethic. You have to have that resilience. And, you know, in order to meet the right people, you have to be able to convey that. And so um, we're going to hand it over now to Rosie. Yay! Oh, we can hear you. Okay. Woo! Awesome. Very much. Um, Baron and Julie, I'm going to mute you guys now just to uh, eliminate some of that feedback. And... So, you know, just taking a step back again, you started also on more the sport horse side of the industry. Um, you had a riding career that completely blew people away. You have so many fans, and now you're really involved in aftercare. And that's actually one of the biggest questions that a lot of the newcomers to the industry ask is, you know, what is the outlook for horses that retire from racing but you know take us back to the very beginning what inspired you to get involved in the thoroughbred industry tell us a bit about your educational journey and then we'll talk a bit about the aftercare side of things and um, your involvement in that um well I just first of all I just want to say it's so cool to be on here with Julie and Farron um because it's like legend you know and then I kind of just sort of retired and it's like the up up and coming newcomer and um Farron you I had to look up how old you were while we were on things I'm like she's like the smartest person I've ever known on the racetrack I mean your experience is like outrageous I'm so excited for you and congratulations on a couple of the races that you won recently that's awesome um so I uh I started when I was a kid. My mother was a, a riding instructor and a, um, eventing coach, so I grew up eventing. And I went to Pony Club, um, which uh, United States Pony Club is kind of like college for horses, but it's like starts when you're five, and you can go. I think you can go until you're 21, and then now they actually have an adult program, which like I totally want to go back to. Um, but Pony Club is like the superior high standard of horsemanship. And so I was really, really privileged 
to experience that from such a young age. Um, and I did mostly primarily eventing. Um, I was competing by the time I was four and, um, and then I started eventing like as soon as I was old enough to be let loose on cross country. Um, and through Pony Club, we actually did um, what are called team chases. And it's like a race, but you race with your teammate, your partner. So you have like two ponies. And I mean, I'm talking a 12 hand pony, which is only like, I don't know, 50 inches tall. Um, so you have two ponies racing together, um, kind of for the competition aspect, but you're, you're a team. And then um, I think the fastest time is like your time and then you compete against other pairs. So it was kind of like a cool way of being introduced to racing in a really um, safe and fun way at such a young age. Um, my sister did her first pony. My sister is six years older and she did her first pony race at five years old. And so she got back. She actually, we started getting seriously into pony racing when I was six. And I remember it was like this, you know, this year, this never ending year, because my mother made me wait till I was seven before I could ride my first race. Um, and I just got completely addicted to it. Um, I joke now because I'm back into eventing um, that when I was a kid, dressage was actually the reason I became a jockey because I just didn't have the patience and the, you know, self-discipline for, you know, t taking the precision that goes into dressage and making, you know, that a, a priority. So all I want to do is get on and go fast. And that's what pony racing allowed me to do. Um, so I got really into that. And I actually ended up having to quit pony club <clears throat> because we ended up being always away on the weekends racing. Uh, I grew up actually coincidentally in New Jersey. Uh, nowhere near Monmouth, and I had never been to Monmouth, but um, we would travel like two to six hours to go pony racing, and my mom ended up with um, about like six serious pony racing kids in between the ages of my sister and I, so we'd be going to Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> doing this like pony racing circuit, and we were super competitive, but we learned, you know, my through Pony Club and my mother as a coach, we learned the conditioning of the ponies. We learned how to take care of their leg, you know, wrap their legs, um, all of the different aspects of the horsemanship like Julie was talking about. It's just the most important thing is that those fundamentals of horsemanship. Um, and that's like 100 percent. There is no question asked. That is where you want to start when you get into the racing industry. I mean, th there's so many steps to take before you actually get to the racetrack. And I think when people come to the racetrack too soon, it can really set you back um, for not getting that foundation. And, um, you know, once you're on the racetrack, things are at such a fast pace. There's so many uh, opportunities that mistakes are so detrimental, whether it's, you know, getting hurt or things like that. So, it's just so important to have um, the foundation of horsemanship, um, experience, experience, experience. You know, I literally started galloping my pony when I was seven, six years old. Um, and then when I was 13, I actually went to a farm and galloped for Jonathan Shepard. And that was like, blow your mind, crazy experience at 13 years old. But, you know, and I, I worked seven days at 13. I moved in. Uh, my sister had moved out. And so I went to live with her for the summer. And at 13 years old, I worked seven days a week from 5.30 to probably 1 o'clock. Uh, the hours are so much longer on the farm. Um, but, I mean, and I did everything that every adult there did. And I got paid one-tenth of what everybody else got paid. But um, it was just like the, you know, the drive to be there, wanting to soak up every single aspect of what was going on around you. Like I remember I got to hot walk with anticipation and it was like the biggest deal. Yeah. The biggest deal in the world. I got to hot walk with anticipation and, um, but my influence on the racetrack, I was very far from the racetrack. This is kind of backing up before I got to Jonathan's. Um, like I said, I grew up in New Jersey, but nowhere near the track. I had no connections to the track. Um, but I heard of this woman jockey called Julie Crone. And so obviously, you know, she was totally awesome. And that was, you know, she just did her thing. She won the Belmont. Like, yeah. So uh, when I was like seven, seven, probably seven years old, um, 
a friend of my parents gave us a VHS tape called The Jewels of the Triple Crown. And it, uh, it's, you can find it on YouTube, actually. I saw it, someone uh, shared it on Twitter a couple of years ago, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the best movie of all time. And so it, uh, it actually tells the story of all the Triple Crown winners. Um, and funny that Julie was so inspired by Steve Cawthon growing up watching that VHS tape. And now we grew up without, I was raised by hippies, so we didn't have any television. We like just had VHS. And so I would watch this movie over and over and over and over until I like knew every single aspect of every single story. And um, so after watching um, the story of Affirmed and Steve Cawthon, I made it my goal to be not only the first female to win the Triple Crown, but also the youngest person. So I was going to have to do it when I was 17. So I totally missed that goal. I really like, you know, you know, still haven't won the Derby. Oh, well. But um, that was really where my inspiration came. And, um, you know, <clears throat> Julie wasn't in that video, but I had heard of Julie from literally that's that's all I knew was that there was this woman that, you know, kicked everybody's butt and she was totally awesome. I didn't even know that Julie wrote it at Monmouth Park in New Jersey. I had no idea of anything, um, but I just knew um, that that's what I wanted to do. And so the, the influence with the pony racing um, led a lot more towards steeplechasing because the pony races are held at the steeplechase meet. So steeplechasing is racing over jumps. Um, and Jonathan Shepard, is, uh, he actually trains both. Uh, so that's how I got hooked up with him. But that was a great avenue for getting the flat racing aspect. And that's like really where I wanted to go. Like racing seems so much more real to me and so much more competitive, fast paced on the flat track than it did. Um, over jumps. So that's where I just focused. And from that point on, I was tunnel vision. I was going to be a jockey. Um, <clears throat> and so my sister had moved out and she pursued steeplechasing um, first as a rider and then as a trainer. And so I kind of just followed in her footsteps all around where she went. And I would just work for who during the summers, every vacation, every Thanksgiving, Christmas vacation, spring break, I would was off to my sister's to just gallop for whoever she had been working for. Um, and then when I was 14 years old, um, I was going to school in New Jersey and my sister was in Maryland and uh, my dad and my sister would meet halfway so I could go gallop two days a week on the weekends. And I mean, it was just, there was nothing else. I mean, here all my high school friends are like partying and I'm just like, see you later. I'm going to, you know, going to gallop horses. and. Um, I actually did decide wise beyond my years. I decided when I was 14 that my 15 year old year when I was a sophomore in high school, I said, I want nothing to do with horses. Absolutely nothing to do with horses. I've done it my whole life. I've been competing since I was four. And I know when I turn 16, I'm never, ever going to have, a. am never going to stop. So I want to, I want to take a little break, refresh. When I'm 16, I can get my license at the track and off I went. And that's exactly what I did. So I ended up um, working for Dickie Small, who was a few barns down from Holly Robinson, who is the trainer that my sister was working for. I lived in her basement. Uh, my parents let me move out when I was 16 and pursue my dreams. And they kind of just said, if this is what you want to do, you better go do it. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the inter most interesting questions that I've gotten um, through my whole career and after is, you know, why are there not more successful female jockeys? And I have never had the answer to this. I'm, I mean, I literally can say like, I don't know. I don't, I don't see it. I don't know what the difference is, but I recently figured the difference out. Um, I just read a finished a book called The Code of the Extraordinary Mind. And it helped me realize that the difference is there are a lot of female jockeys, but probably just jockeys in general, who say, you know, this is obviously a super competitive industry. It's cutthroat. It's so, you know, every man for himself, it can be at times. And so I think a lot of people go into it with this really great attitude of, I'm going to do whatever it takes to knock down these barriers. And there's nothing wrong with that attitude. It's exactly the right attitude. But the difference is for Julie and for me, we never knew there were barriers. We just never saw them. 
And so if you don't see something, it doesn't exist. And that is why Julie was so successful in her day. That's why she climbed the fence because she didn't see any problem. She couldn't get in the stable gate. No problem. I'll just climb the fence. And it was the same thing. You know, I mean, if you don't see the barriers, they're not there. So there is always a way to get into whatever part of the industry that you want to get to. It's being smart, like Farron, because she's like the smartest person I've ever heard of on the racetrack. Um, and getting yourself connected to, you know, the best people in the industry. Um, and, you know, there's there's people that come to the racetrack all the time that, you know, have some experience here or there. Um, and you just really have to come. Like when you get to the racetrack phase of, a, of, of the racing industry career, you have to just assume that you don't know anything. There's so much to learn once you get there. Everything goes at such a fast pace. And it's just like, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I was given is that you can learn something from any person on the racetrack. I mean, when you see a 75 year old hot walker who's living in a dorm and getting paid $7 per horse to walk a horse, that person can teach you something. Everybody, anybody, any groom, any exercise rider, you know, there's something that you can learn from every single person that you encounter who's had experience on the racetrack. And it's just all about soaking that up. Um, <clears throat> And, and getting the foundation um, of the horsemanship. And just, you know, like Farron was saying, like, you've got to want to be there at 5 a.m. all day, every day. When Julie was talking about taking naps in the jocks room, I was like, I was like the dragon of naps. Like, you don't wake me up. Like, my valet was the same. Like, no shot. <laughs> she is unavailable. <laughs> I would take, when I had the bug, when I was in Farron's position and I was an apprentice, um, I breezed as many as 10 horses every morning. And then I rode almost every race on the card almost every day. And I would literally set my alarm. I mean, so when you, when you get off a horse after a race, you have probably 25 minutes, 30 minutes at most to get ready until you come out of the gate on your next horse. So you've got like, let's say 10, 15 minutes from the time you dismount one horse to the time you check your weight with the next horse, I was setting my alarm for two minutes to take a nap in between. Like it is the most exhausting experience. And, and, but like your adrenaline is like just insanely, incredibly fueled by, you know, the drive. It's, it's just like so fun. When I was riding at the fairgrounds my very first year, I, uh, I went down there uh, against the advice of so many people because everyone thought I was just following my boyfriend, which I totally was, but I would never admit it. <laughs> but, um, I was like venturing into the land of the Cajun badass jockeys that were like, it was, I mean, I was intimidated. I would never have let anyone know that, but I was really intimidated. And so I went down there thinking like, okay, in, in four months, like, I really, you know, I hope I win 30 races. And I got down there and I just, they were really nasty. The boys were really intimidating. I mean, they were, they were big bad boys down there. And they, they really let me have it. And they let me know that they weren't going to give me any breaks, which of course I wouldn't have wanted. Um, and um, I just kept my mouth shut and kind of just held my ground. And Julie, I wish I could hear what you were saying, but I can't. Um. <laughs> yeah, Rosie. I called Rosie. I used to watch the races from Louisiana, and I called her one day, and I said, oh, my. And she she won the race. But let me tell you, this day, they were, like, looking for her and turning their horses. And, man, she would just, like, take back, and she'd be like, hmm. And then she'd just, like, bust through some hole or do something. And I'd text her afterwards or, like, messenger on facebook and i'd be like oh my god that was epic and she was like they're only making me better that's all they're that doing true. Every time they i do i became a better rider when yep. i went down there they were so yep. they were really tough on me in the beginning and what's funny is when i first went there i won the very first race of the meet and 
you know, it was kind of like, oh, you know, everyone sort of thought it was a fluke. But I also had just, before I went down there, I had just ridden my first Breeders' Cup race and my horse, uh, it was a turf race, and my horse fell in the first turn. He slipped and it was like a, it's like a really firm turf course that got wet on the top, so it was super slick. So going in my first Breeders' Cup race ever, like worst experience ever, I'm going into the first turn and my horse just slips out from underneath me. And so when I got down to the fairgrounds right after that, I was so afraid to pull on my left rein around the turf course. I had this like this feeling of I'm going to slip. And so I kept blowing the turn and like they just thought I really couldn't ride. And I was really proving them right on the turf. But um, but yeah, no, I and then everyone was kind of like, oh, yeah, congratulations when I won that first race. And then I kept on winning. And then they were like, mm, we can't be having this. <laughs> you know? And then they started to kind of give me a hard time. But, you know, I just keeping my mouth shut and just holding my ground. Um, they really came around and honestly, one of my career highlights was having the respect of pretty much every jockey in the jock room at fairgrounds. And so, um, you know, it's just, it's a tough game. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, girl, guy, young, old, like it is tough. Um, but what I was going to say is by the end of that meet with my goal of 30 races, I ended up winning 110 races and the very, uh, second to last day of the meet was. Um, Louisiana Derby Day. I think I rode 12 races that day. Um, I won five, uh, including the Derby. And the day after that day, like I was, there was nothing left of me. There was no energy. There was no body weight. There was no nothing. It was just like complete exhaustion. I was riding on literally pure adrenaline and it is just so addicting. Um, and I just loved it. I mean, it was, it was this one of the coolest times. And I just, I had the best career. I mean, I, I hate to admit it when I was talking about, um, you know, not seeing the barriers. When I went to New York, there was like a 30 second period where I said to myself, well, maybe it is tougher because I'm a girl. And then I quickly snapped out and I said, no, it's not because you're not freaking good enough. You're not as good as these New York jockeys. And it was totally true. And by the time I retired, I was getting there. I was like at a turning point where I could have really dug in and been the best in a circuit like New York. Or I could have said, eh, I'd rather go have kids. <laughs> and so uh, the very last summer that I rode at Saratoga, I went into the jock stream one day and this is why this is during the period where my husband and I were having conversations behind the scenes about having kids and I was riding on top of all. Um, she was headed to the breeders cup. She'd won the Oaks that year. And I went into the job and I was tired. I think I was mostly tired and I went into the jock room and I was marking my scratches for the day and angel Cordero comes up next to me. One of my favorite people in the racing industry, Angel Cordero could listen to that man talk for days. The stories he tell, I mean, unbelievable. And so he comes up and we're marking scratches next to each other. Hey, Angel. Hey, Rosie, what's up? And he turned to me, and this is one of my other highlights of my career. He turned to me and he said, did you ever consider that you could be the best jockey in the whole country? And I turned to him and I said, you know what, Angel? I have. And I decided I don't want to do it. And that was literally probably during the time I was getting pregnant. <laughs> and I just had this different mindset. And my my career could not have ended in any more of a storybook manner to end up finding out I was pregnant with a timeline to ride the Breeders' Cup and then just throw the reins in the air and say, peace out. <laughs> it was fun. And I just had the, I had the best of racing. I really did. And I think you know, as the female aspect of it, I, I had, I was given almost probably 99% of every opportunity I deserved because I just didn't see any reason why I would. And so after retiring, um, I, I went straight into being my husband's assistant, uh, which was, it was like, 
throwing me back into pony club because <laughs> I had to learn everything all over again as far as horsemanship. I mean, the one thing about being a jockey is especially when you get up to the higher levels, people are so protective over the horses and it's like you're, you know, you're being led to the track or pony to the track on each horse. You're being pony to the pole. And I got to a point where I was like, just let me ride this horse, you know, just let me have a little time with him. You know, I, I really started to miss working with horses because they were so delicate um, and everything was worth so much money and everything was so well protected. And so in those later years, it was, what I think was lacking for me was getting to work with the horses, getting to be part of the development, um, getting to be part of, you know, the team that works with the horse. And so when I retired and I started working for my husband as his assistant, I just was like eating that up. You know, it was so fun to be part of the development, be part of the training. I learned so much and, um, I just loved it. And then I had, uh, Back in 2008, I rode a, uh, well, 2006, I rode a horse that I fell in love with. Um, I got on him to breeze him one day. He was just another horse in the shed row for a barn that I breezed a lot of horses for. And, but it's from the time I walked out to the barn to the time I made it to the racetrack, he was my favorite horse. I loved him. Um, and I jogged backwards, you know, we're warming up on the outside, trotting around to get ready for the breeze. And he just had this like lovely stride, this long neck, nice, mature, classy, classy horse. And then when we turned around, he like completely fooled me. And I like go off to this really long hold, nice and relaxed. And he completely took off with me. And I, from that, like from that day on, I could breeze that horse and I could only ever get him an eighth of a mile before I was supposed to start before he started breezing. Um, so he was super tough, but I, I fell in love with him. I kept track of him. I rode him for four different trainers. Um, I won two races on him. And then um, he was claimed by a guy that was pretty, let's say, not well liked in the industry um, and taken to Suffolk Downs. And I followed the horse. And when he finally dropped him back down to the bottom class, I claimed the horse. And um, I just didn't couldn't take that horse being in that outfit. And I, I gave him to my mom. I took him down to her farm and I said, retrain this horse, use him for your students, use him, what, do whatever you want, compete him, do this, whatever. And I said, I just want to come down once a month and go cross country schooling. <laughs> That's all I want to do is be my fun horse. So um, that was in 2008 and I still have that horse. And he was the first one that I got back into eventing on. And it was really that horse from the, back when he was being retrained that I would go once in a while to ride him and the horse was so happy to do what he was doing he was so um happy to please willing to please you know dying to please um he had so much fun it was like to watch this horse who I only knew as a racehorse and then making this transformation like it was so inspiring and I never even like at that point I was never thinking of venting you know, I was just wanted to come have fun once in a while. And so that horse really inspired me. And um, when I retired, I had started competing him again. And um, I always kind of knew from that point that I wanted to do something with, you know, transitioning horses and restarting and uh, 15 years away from eventing and, you know, sport horses, I had, oh, God, I was starting at the beginning, like I look back at my lessons back in 2013 and I'm like oh my god what do these people think of me but um you know I've just kind of gone back to the basics and learn and now knowing knowing everything that I know from the racetrack and then having all that foundation of horsemanship from before I rode um I just like I'm so inspired by every single horse that I work with every day um it's so rewarding and you know I kind of got into it like I have no idea what I'm doing like <laughs> I'm just playing around with horses but now um you know I've I've just stumbled upon a program of doing things that I I found that work and I love it now I have like a a go-to like I do the same thing and it just works every single time you know to to get these horses really well adjusted and you know just uh, expose them to enjoying their life and their job off the track um, and it's so inspiring. So um, I'm like, it's really incredible to go from as a young child with a passion for the racing industry and then 
you know, like that light just flipped off and this one just flipped on. And here I have like this second life, second career, you know, just like, just like the horses really ironically. And so, um, it's been, I mean, I'm just as passionate about retraining retired horses as I was about being a jockey. And it's just a different part of my life and I'm having a blast. I'm going to jump in and ask a, a question because um, so many people, you know, and, you know, kids from kids in Pony Club to youth in 4-H and people in, you know, different equestrian sports will take on off the track thoroughbreds, but maybe you don't know that much about, you know, the racing side. Uh, what do you think are some advantages of those people who maybe have an off the track thoroughbred but don't understand racing to maybe get a bit more into racing? And um, do you think that would help them understand their horse a bit better? Or what is some of the crossover there? Absolutely. I mean, the the racehorses are exposed to so much on the racetrack and they get so much experience, especially if you have an older horse. Um, and then they also go through so much, uh, so many changes in their body, um, changes in their, you know, mental maturity at different ages. And if people knew, like, I feel like that's one of the huge assets that I have in retraining is, and, and there's more and more people that I'm finding that have, you know, exercise ridden or been jockeys that are, you know, retraining now. And it, it just gives you such a perspective on what they already know. Um, like Julie was saying, like, you can recognize a horse's personality just by looking at it, you know? I mean, that was like one of the things when you're in the paddock, Julie, and you're, you're get, about to get a leg up on a horse you've never seen before in your life. Like, you can kind of tell so many things before you even make it to the racetrack. It's just like, things just click. I mean, horses are just like, they it just come so naturally. So there's so much experience. I think people have kind of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a inaccurate perspective of what horses, of, of a horse's experience on the racetrack. Um, you know, and once you realize like all the steps that they go through to get there, the breaking process, the thorough breaking process, um, what they learn when they get there, what they do know, what they don't know, you know, so when you're retraining a horse and you're, you know, you're so frustrated because it won't do this because it has never been asked to do that before, you know, it's never been given that sort of, um, or never been asked for that sort of coordination. Um, so I think getting to know the racehorse's life before it retires is so helpful to helping retrain the horse afterwards. It just gives you a real great perspective and, um, you know, it kind of helps you give the horse the benefit of the doubt a little bit. Uh, so there's, you know, there's bad apples in all realms of every horse sport, but, um, most of these horses are so well-rounded, so willing to please, so adjustable. Um, I have two thoroughbreds right now who haven't eaten grain and I can't even tell you when because their immune systems have adjusted, their digestive systems have adjusted to, you know, living like horse skin, living naturally, you know, on turned out on 20 acres of land and just being horses. Their, you know, their skin doesn't get bothered and it takes them a while to get there, but it's totally in the realm of any thoroughbred. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. That is, that was just an incredible overview of, you know, your whole career and what you've learned along the way. And, you know, for those people who are still tuned in, I've been taking notes on all these resources that have been recommended along the way and some of the key highlights of this hangout. So I'll make sure to post that in, in the classroom afterwards. But at this time, just for the sake of time, I am going to open it up for questions from people. Um, if you guys want to uh, type questions into the chat or if anybody is, is brave enough to want to turn on your video and mic and and ask any of these incredible ladies a question I'm going to turn Baron and Julie's mic back on oh just kidding it won't let me unmute you guys but yeah so go ahead everybody ask away and um, we will leave probably about 15 minutes for questions and if other people don't have questions, well, I always have questions. So let's see. I, you know, okay, so here's something to get the question started. 
I want to hear each of your guys' favorite race. So a race that people can go back and watch that you guys found particularly inspiring and that other people might watch and feel very captured by. Because I think we all kind of have a favorite race horse, you know, an individual horse that really captured us or a particular race that really drew us in. For me, it was Ruffian. I just loved Ruffian. So I'd love to hear from you guys what your favorite race was. Well, my one of my favorite races, I always, when people always ask me, like, what was your favorite horse and stuff like that? And you could always name, like, your champions that you rode. But when I had days when I won multiple races, or in the very beginning of my career when I had horses that I won more than one race on, and there was this little, I don't think you could ever find the videos now, but there was this little gray horse I rode at Atlantic City, and his name was Gray Dude. And I never rode him with a whip. You couldn't even carry the whip on him. Like, if he even saw the whip, like, that much in his eye, his toes would go in the ground. And, man, he would not go. He'd be like, and you'd have to drop the whip and, like, be like, I'm so sorry. He would do anything for me. He would just, like, I would just push on his neck or cluck or just pinch him or just pull back or turn him. I could go and stop, like, five times in a race, and he didn't even care. I could send him to the lead. I could take him in the back. I won five races on him right the year after I lost my bug, and it was one of the best experiences I ever had in my life to be so close with a horse and so intimate and not be attached to his form and to realize that even like if there's like a speed horse, you know, they can always have an opportunity to learn more. Like they can have a racing style, but they don't have to be like forever that way, you know, and they're going to be way more valuable a horse if they can do more than one racing style. So I fell in love with Gray Dude, and he was one of my favorite horses to ride because he taught me so much about uh, uh, thoroughbreds, like how dynamic their brains can be and how capable they can be of uh, getting outside of their form or their comfort zone. You know, like Rosie was talking about how, you know, they're treated a certain way and they're catered to and they're not given any inconveniences to like, you know, mess with their head so they can just go out and do their little job and then they come home. But they're, I think that we underestimate what they're really capable of sometimes. And uh, and I, I always thought it was crazy, too, when I'd look back on my, my career at the fair tracks. I used to ride this two-year-old quarter horse filly, and I'd ride her two-year-old uh, fillies. And then seven races later, I'd ride her in the open quarter horse race with mares. And she'd win both of them. <laughs> like, you know, three and a half laters after. And she'd race every Saturday and Sunday. And then she'd have the whole winter off. And during the summer, she'd race every Saturday and Sunday. Um, and so even when I left, I would always call the guy and be like, hey, Dave. And he'd go, oh, yeah, she's still winning. She was like 10 years old, still winning races at the fair tracks all the time. So Gray Dude was one of my favorite horses to ever ride. No one will ever hear about him. But he really solidified my, my ability to, to know that if I ask the right way and reward the right way, that horses are capable of so many things. And then uh, and then maybe my other one was another multiple win day with uh, at Saratoga and with anticipation was my fifth win of the day. And so it was kind of crazy because it felt, because winning for Jonathan Shepard, first of all, is just like the bee's knees. Okay? It's just like, he's everything that racing, the, the whole racing is. And when, any days I had multiple win days, but actually winning on with anticipation and having that be my fifth win um, I was boxed in and I asked him for like three runs and it was so crazy. At the I got really boxed in from the, from the 3H pole to the quarter pole and he was so relaxed that he was inside of a box with 12 horses and his ears were like this and he literally looked back at me in the tack and he goes, are we going to be going soon? You know, because he'd see a little spot and it was all closed in. It was Pat Day and Angel Cordero and Aunt Lee and nobody was going to let me through. And then about 70 yards to the wire, uh, Pat Day kind of like moved up behind a horse and then a the guy saw him and then kind of slid out a little and I just like shoved on with anticipation like four times and just chopped his head right on the wire. And so that, the feeling of like uh, rounding out your day and your whole day's experience with having five, like Rosie winning Louisiana Derby and then five that day, craziness. Best time ever. And I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna interject with a comment that we have from Lori Mays, and Lori had actually shared this story from me, and she shared it with everyone in the comments, which I think is absolutely awesome. But she said, "Great story regarding Julie. As a seven-year-old horse crazy girl in Georgia, I wrote a letter to her, as she was the coolest and possibly only female jockey at the time, 
to my surprise, she wrote me back a personal letter along with an autographed photo of herself in Josh's house. It is still in my house 30 years later. I will never forget her generosity and how you inspired so many children. So that is so cool. I'm not just dive into the whole, like, over and over again, people who I encounter in the industry talk about the importance of role models and having mentors. And, and you know, I think that really reflects the goal behind having these hangouts is, like, you know, we have these amazing three professionals here who are mentoring and setting an example for other people. Guess who texted us after Karen won her second? Well, she won five already. But guess who texted us? She won two in one day. Steve Coffin. He's like, oh, so great to see you guys winning. Farron is all that stuff you said she was. She's doing a really great job. And Steve Coffin had a winner that day, a horse that he had ridden the, the sister. He had ridden a grade one winner on the sister. And Wesley Ward trains horse, and he won a race at Saratoga that day. So the interaction of him texting us, like me as an agent and her as a jockey, because I shared with him, like I was like, oh, I'm going to Saratoga, I'm going to Mama to be a, an agent this summer. He's like, whoa, that's so cool. Good luck. And, and our children, our kids both like theater, and so his wife and I like talk about theater stuff all the time. And then when I forwarded the text to her, the full circle of me being a jockey because of Steve Cawthon, yeah. and then sharing it with her, it was just like my head exploded. And then Steve having a winner that day at Saratoga with Wesley Ward and a horse that he had rode the sister, the mother's, you know, the mother's of. was just like so collected. And then Rosie talking about walking with anticipation. It's just so beautiful, like what you said, the connection and the synchronicity of everybody being together in the game and loving the sport. Yeah. You know, I have a funny story about that, too. Um, just like things coming full circle. <clears throat> so when I was working for Jonathan, <clears throat> One of the first horses I got to breeze was a filly called Tanwi Spring. And <clears throat> so I was galloping for him. I was like 13. And then four years later, um, I was still eligible to ride the junior horse races at the steeplechase meet. So a lot of times the professional trainers would throw a horse in there as like a breeze. So I rode that filly, Tanwi Spring, in this junior race. A um, couple of years later down the road, I had my license and I was riding at Delaware Park and I got the call on Tanwee Spring at Delaware Park. Um, she ended up getting hurt just before that and becoming a broodmare, so I never did ride her at the track. But I just saw on Facebook one of her offspring as a horse that had been taken off the track. And it was just like this random Philly has just come across my life like so many different times. It's just crazy how that all works. But I mean, it's. It's so full circle for me that it just, it's really crazy and so enjoyable. Yeah, for me, um, it was before I became a jockey, but when I was exercise riding for the summer at Del Mar, the best horse I'd ever been on, he was winning um, big stake races, and I was getting to gallop him in the morning, which was really exciting for me. And then I went down to Breeders' Cup uh, to help with the Lasix vets at Del Mar, and then he won the stake race, and then at the end of it, um, he had a bone fracture, and so the surgeon I'd been working with that last summer said, hey, are you going to be here tomorrow? I'll do the surgery when you're free, and you can help me. So I got to scrub in. I got to put the screws into his leg, ah. and we weren't wow. sure if he would come back to racing or not. We thought he would just retire and become um, you know, some sort of riding horse. And then the following spring, I came down to Santa Anita, went back to that barn, and there he was, back in training. So I got to get back on him oh, and ride wow. him. Wow! So that, that was crazy. really full circle for me. Wow. wow! That is just that is so beyond cool. And I think that you know, for newcomers just getting involved in the thoroughbred industry, um, you guys are going to find that over and over again. And actually, I have my own funny story about speaking of full circle. One of my first internships uh, in the thoroughbred industry was working for the Saratoga Special Newspaper. So I was writing for the horse racing newspaper in Saratoga. And I got my, my start in racing at a very small track in North Dakota called the North Dakota Horse Park. And so my, my first trainer who I interviewed while I was working for the Saratoga Special was Joe Sharp, Rosie's husband. 
I was so nervous. I was you know, shaking. I had done interviews before, but all of a sudden I was in Saratoga, which is one of the most, you know, magical places in the world and, you know, one of the best tracks in the United States. And I'm interviewing Joe and somehow I I don't even know how I said it, but mentioned that I, I had worked at the North Dakota Horse Park. And Joe goes, Wait, like the track in Fargo, North Dakota? I was kind of surprised because nobody knows where that is. And he goes, I was one of the leading jockeys there. <laughs> and sure he, but he, he pulled out his phone and started showing me these jockey win photos. And it immediately just made me feel at ease. Um, I was able to, to stop shaking for the rest of the interview. But it was so cool. Wherever you go in this industry, you're always going to find a horse or a person or stuff have people. 10 gazillion times, which is so, so cool. But I'm actually, we do have a question. Um, Farron, you had mentioned working at a, you know, Nissan rehabilitation facility in Kentucky, and Jeff Cannon asked if that was Kesmark. Yes, it is. And so could you just tell us a little bit more about Kesmark and what they do? So I understand it, you know, it's an amazing place and they do internships there. And so that might be something people would like to know more about. Yeah, it's very hands-on. You live right there at the facility. It, like I said, it's across the street from the Keeneland Racetrack. It's near to all these thoroughbred farms. So you're really right there in the heart of everything. And then you're learning how to put on bandages. Um, they have swimming pools for the horses. They have underwater treadmills, saltwater spas, hyperbaric oxygen chambers. They have a track for them to start rehabbing. Um, so you kind of get to see a whole variety of injuries. Some horses just come in there uh, for yearling prep for the sales, and they swim a lot to, you know, pr protect their bones and just build up that muscle. So, um, yeah, it's very hands-on. Really, a lot of work. I mean, the hours were, I think, probably 6 or 7 a.m. to, like, 5 p.m., and you're usually on call through the night when horses ship in, and you'd get one day off a week. But the connections you can get just from being there are incredible. And still, probably five of my intern mates I keep in contact with pretty regularly. So I made some of my best friends there. That is so cool. Yeah, internships are such a valuable. That's always one of my you know, recommendations to people getting into the industry is to seek out as many different learning experiences and internships as possible and uh you know search and seek out those types of opportunities and then, you know um for people who aren't familiar with amplify we have a list of internships compiled on our website and for different educational programs and universities with racetrack programs and schools so you know make sure to talk to people get their advice and then you know seek out programs like that where you can get that hands-on experience and then this might be our last question, guys, before we wrap it up, because I see we are reaching 8.30. You are three very busy ladies, but what is your favorite, <laughs> what is your favorite track you've raced at? Whatever track I'm at at the time, and whatever the weather is, is my favorite weather, because you don't get to have that convenience of saying, like, oh, that's my favorite track. You just love wherever you are, and I love it when it rains, too. I, I would have said that. the same thing. I would have said whichever one I'm winning at. Yeah, that was always my answer. <laughs> I would there's, there's like fond memories <laughs> of each of them, except for Aqueduct. Aqueduct gets kicked out of because <laughs> there's no good weather there, Julie. I, I was just there. trying to talk her into going there. Thanks, Rosie. There never go. Oh well, you know. It, it's no, we want to go to Maryland. We want to go to its purpose. Just dress warm. And yeah, be prepared to be cold <laughs> and slightly miserable. But other than that, it's great. <laughs> yeah, for me, Delmar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> New York, New York in general so will make you tough. Yeah. <laughs> and the crowd at Delmar, I've never ridden in such a crowd of people. Keeneland. Keeneland's Best cool. Crowds ever. Best crowds ever at Keeneland. Yeah, mm -hmm. Keeneland's good. Keeneland's so so, I always hated Keeneland because it was too hard to win. Uh, so <laughs> hard. <laughs> and then they so moved the wire. 
Gosh, no, it's so amazing. Like every track has such a different vibe to it. You know, yeah, you mentioned really the Mark for the Horse Park. Obviously, that one's like <laughs> nothing can top that for me. You know, it doesn't get any more glorious or amazing. But you know, I also love Saratoga. And uh, yeah, well, I was, I've also been asked, like, you know, if there's one race you could win, what would it be? And everyone expects your answer to be the Kentucky Derby, but I always would have said the Preakness because that was where I rode my first races at Pimlico and where I galloped, and okay. I was second. <laughs> it was really mine, was long, the but... mine was the Belmont for the same reason, same exact yeah. reason. Yeah. Wow, that is so so incredible. Well, I just have to thank you guys so much, the three of you, for you know taking a huge chunk of your time to share your own experiences uh, in the thoroughbred industry and you know promote education about this incredible sport. And for those of you who tuned in tonight, thank you so much. As I mentioned when we started, I'm going to be sending out a survey for you guys to kind of review this presentation and tell us what you love and you know what you'd like to hear more about in the future. I welcome everybody to tune in for our future hangouts. The next one is going to be on August 18th, and it's going to be focused on marketing and communication. So we have a specialist in um, racetrack communications and recruiting, uh, another individual who specializes in farm marketing and also has podcasts, and another person who is a international traveler who does some writing on the side. So a really cool variety. And, you know, I, I welcome everybody to follow Amplify on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. We're now on TikTok and soon to be on YouTube. And always check out the website for any other resources. Um, again, thank you guys so, so much for being on tonight. Good job. This is a really cool thing you put together. And thank you for bringing Farron and I together with Rosie. That was really fun. Yeah, this was That awesome. was really fun. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, I love it. Well, this is an experience for me too. So, good with luck, that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, Farron, and hopefully see you guys all in person soon. Yes, I hope so. Bye. Good night and goodbye.